This is chapter 28, which deals with development and inheritance. We will be focusing on the developmental uh, portion of it. So starting with fertilization, the zygote is the cell that's formed by the union of the, the sperm and the oocyte. And it becomes, it's a diploid cell. Remember the sperm and the oocyte were both haploid, meaning they both had half the number of chromosomes. For humans, that would be 23 chromosomes. So the zygote, because of this um, fusion of the sperm and oocyte, it now becomes diploid, meaning it has two copies, or for humans, 46 chromosomes now. The sperm can survive in the uterine tubes for about three to five days in that range. But the oocyte can only survive for 24 hours after ovulation. So if it is not fertilized within 24 hours, it is going to die, disintegrate, and be shed during menses. The sperm has to go through a process known as uh, capacitation or priming. And what that does, it's going to enable the sperm to be able to penetrate through the outer layer of the oocyte. The oocyte has multiple layers. The actual oocyte is interior and it's surrounded by several uh, different layers of cells. So the sperm has to be able to penetrate through all those outer layers. And that process um, is going to be assisted by a lot of the fluids that are present in the female reproductive tract. What attracts the sperm to the oocyte? How does it know where to find it? Basically, there, it's a chemical, um, what we call chemotaxis, positive chemotaxis. Chemicals are released by the oocyte that will attract the sperm to it. Once the sperm is there, it has to burrow through those outer layers to be able to reach that oocyte and has to fuse with the plasma membrane. Once it does fuse in <coughs> with the plasma membrane of the oocyte, penetration by any additional sperm is going to be prevented and inhibited. Remember that there are literally millions of sperm that are released. And so hundreds of them end up near the oocyte, and they're all working to start to break down these outer layers to reach that oocyte that's here in the middle. And so as soon as, like you can see in the picture, you have multiple sperm who are burrowing through these outer layers. But as soon as one finally fuses, uh, reaches that membrane, fuses with it. The nucleus is going to be brought in to the oocyte, and then we'll see the next step uh, occur. And that's when then uh, any of these additional sperm will be prevented from fusing and entering and fertilizing the essentially the oocyte. So as you can see from this picture, the first sperm that reaches the oocyte is not going to be the one that fertilizes it. It's, it's definitely a group effort here, which also just FYI, if there's a low sperm count, that's going to decrease then the chances of a sperm being able to fertilize the egg. Excuse me. You need to have high numbers of sperm to allow for all the sperm to be able to penetrate those outer layers, and then one of them be able to actually then penetrate through, fuse with the plasma membrane, and then be able to fertilize. So once you have the fusion of the ovum and the sperm, um, that resulting cell is called a zygote. And as I said just a bit ago. It, because it has chromosomes from both the egg or the ovum and the sperm, it's now got two copies of everything, and it's a, what we call diploid. Now, if two eggs are released, usually one egg is released during ovulation, but if two eggs happen to be released and both of them become fertilized, those are known as fraternal twins. They are not identical. They have their own unique uh, DNA. If only one... Um, egg is released, but then the zygote in the early stages, it starts going through cell division. If it separates at the two cell stage, you're going to end up with identical twins that have two separate placentas, so they develop separately. 
but they initially were one egg, one sperm, so the DNA will be identical. Now, if that zygote separates a little bit later on in what we call the early blastocyst stage, where you've got between 70 and 100 cells, once again, they're identical twins, but in this case, they're going to share a placenta. Instead of having separate placentas, they're going to share a placenta. So it depends on when the separation occurs um, for identical twins as to do they end up having the same placenta or do they have separate? When we look at the embryonic development, um, the, it's divided into stages. The first two weeks is known as the pre-embryonic stage. Weeks three through eight, we refer to the resulting cells as the embryo. That's as you're going to see in a bit, that's when you see all of the development, the various organs occurring. And then from weeks nine to birth, we refer to it as a fetus. The difference between the embryo and the fetus in that terminology is just in the embryonic stage, you are developing, as I just said, the organs. From the fetus stage till birth, most of the, the basic or what you call the rudimentary structures are formed and it's just growing in size. So that's what part of the distinction is. Uh, are all of these organs functioning as soon as they are formed? No, they are not. Some of them are partially functioning, but they are formed. So if we look at the pre-embryonic stage, the zygote, so you have fertilization occur. Remember that occurs in the uterine tubes or fallopian tubes. The zygote is going to go through very rapid cell division, and it's going to be traveling down towards the uterus. Um, after about three days after fertilization, you have what is the zygote. Some people call it the conceptus. It's about a 16 cell um, mass of cells, and it finally reaches the uterus. It's going to continue going through cell division, and it's going to be kind of floating around in the uterus, and usually by the end of the first week, implantation occurs. Uh, if implantation is not successful, then that blastocyst is going to be shed during menses. And this actually happens a lot more frequently. Some numbers have it as high as about 65% of the time. Um, obviously, a woman would not even know at this point that she technically was pregnant. If implantation is successful, then you start to see the production of the human chronic gonadotropin or HCG. That is what is commonly referred to as the pregnancy hormone. And so that production begins once implantation has occurred. And so in this diagram, it is just showing you have ovulation occurring. Here's your oocyte. <coughs> um, Right here is the sperm you have, just for ease, they're just showing one sperm. But you have fertilization occurring, and then you start to have that cell division occur. Uh, there are minor, small, like peristaltic movements that are moving this down, because if you're wondering, well, why doesn't it go out this way? The movements are flushing it down here towards the uterus. And here you are now at the blastocyst stage. I say it's going to flow around, and then about, a, um, and all of these days are days from fertilization. So now you finally, about a week, you've got implantation occurring here now, finally in the uterus. In terms of some of the membranes, there are several different membranes that are formed that are going to be helping to support that developing embryo. By about week four, the placenta is starting to form. It's not fully formed and not form fully functioning, but it it will start in the formation. And as long as you know the placenta is not there right away, it will eventually help to nourish the embryo. Uh, by about week three, the developing embryo also has three layers of cells that are going 
Each layer is involved with developing into specific structures. So they're going to be involved with forming all the various organs of all the different organ systems. In terms of the actual placenta development, initially the first couple of weeks, the endometrium is what is nourishing that embryo because um, it's implanted in on the endometrium. From weeks 4 to 12, the placenta starts to take over. So it takes time because it's got to form, it's got to get fully developed, etc. <coughs> you also have your umbilical cord. The umbilical cord um, has three blood vessels in it. It has two arteries that are carrying deoxygenated blood and waste from the fetus back to the mother, and one vein that is carrying oxygen and nutrients from the mother to the fetus. The placenta is going to be uh, usually completely developed somewhere in the range of week 14 to 16. It's going to provide nutrition. It's going to uh, provide respiration, excretion, and endocrine function. Now, the placenta is permeable to various, um, especially fat-soluble items. It's permeable to alcohol, nicotine, barbiturates, and other drugs, which is a problem with the mother needs to be careful of what she takes in because some of those um, compounds may be toxic to the developing fetus and it can cross the placenta. Antibiotics can also cross and unfortunately several pathogens, several disease causing microorganisms can also cross that placenta and cause um, infection of the, the developing embryo or fetus depending on the timing. Depending on what microorganism it is and the timing of when in the pregnancy uh, the infection occurs, sometimes the results can be disastrous. So this is just showing uh, the placenta, as you can see here, the developing uh, embryo here with the blood supply. You can see the placenta, the other supporting uh, membranes and organs like the yolk sac, which provides nutrients until the placenta is fully developed. The amniotic fluid, which is helping to provide protection uh, for the developing, that will remain throughout the pregnancy for the developing fetus. One thing I just want to point out here, <coughs> excuse me, is that as you can see here, it's the umbilical cord with the arteries and veins. So this is the fetal blood supply here. Now, this is the mother's blood supply. They will come in very close contact, but there is not actual mixing of the maternal blood with the fetal blood. They come very close so you can have that exchange occur, similar to what you saw with the capillaries, say the pulmonary capillaries, the exchange between uh, the oxygen and the alveoli and the blood and the CO2. So they come very close, but they do not actually mix. So that's why it's possible for uh, the mother to have one blood type excuse me, in the developing fetus, it's going to have a different blood type. Organogenesis is the development of all the organs. Um, as I mentioned a bit ago, the rudimentary structures occur within the first eight weeks as far as the development of them. The heart does start uh, beating about the beginning of week four. Some people say about week three, but certainly by week four, the heart is beating. It's not initially pumping blood. The blood uh, is being pumped by week five. It has to wait until the liver starts producing those red blood cells. If you don't have red blood cells, it's kind of hard to pump blood. By about weeks four and five, you uh, can see the eye pits where the eyes are going to be are forming. You see buds of where the limbs, your arms and legs are going to be. The pulmonary system is also starting to form. Uh, by week seven, the, all the facial structures are much more complex. In week eight, all the major brain structures are also formed. 
So by about the end of week uh, eight, week nine, like I say, the basic structures are all there. They may not be fully functioning, but they're there. Fetal development, this, what's going to happen here is, um, and like I say, usually about week, week eight to nine is where you have that transition in the terminology from the embryo to fetus. So with the fetal development, you're going to have continued cell growth. You're also going to have cell differentiation, where cells will just think, okay, this one's going to be developing into bone or muscle or nerve, etc. Roughly from weeks 9 to 12, the sexual differentiation occurs. The genetics are there for whether it's going to be male or female, but you don't start seeing the um, differentiation as far as the ovaries versus the testes being formed until weeks 9 through 12. The fetal circulatory system does have shunts in it until childbirth because it's relying on the mother for bringing in the oxygen and the nutrients, etc. And so the lungs are not actually breathing in the air, obviously. And so there are shunts that allow enough blood, say, to go to the lungs to nourish those tissues, but they're not having to perform the gas exchange. The liver, the mother is filtering all of the, the blood, you know, getting rid of waste products. So the liver just needs enough blood, once again, for that tissue to be growing and to be maintained, but it's not functioning as a filter. And so some of the shunts that we see in the fetal circulatory system, the ductus venosus, this bypasses the liver and goes straight to the um, inferior vena cava. The foramen ovale shunts from the right atrium directly to the left atrium. It bypasses that whole pulmonary circulation. Now, like I say, some blood will go through down to the right ventricle and then on to the lungs and back to the left atrium, but a lot of it is shunted directly from the right atrium to the left atrium. And then the ductus arteriosus this is a shunt from the pulmonary artery straight to the aorta. <coughs> so that's what it is showing here in this diagram. Obviously, uh, with the placenta here and the mother supplying the needs and getting rid of the, the waste products, etc., as this blood is coming in. In the heart here, you can see from the inferior vena cava, it would go to the right atrium. Well, right here, you shunt. This little purple line here. So some of it will go to the right ventricle, to the pulmonary trunk, to the pulmonary arteries, to both lungs. But some of it shunts right here to this little yellow. That's the foramen ovale. And then the blood that goes to the right ventricle and up the pulmonary trunk, Right here, yes, some will go to the lungs to help maintain those tissues, but right here, the ductus arteriosus, well, you shunt, bypass the lungs completely, and go straight to the aorta. And then down here is the ductus venosus that shunts, um, instead of going to the, the liver, bypass it. Mom already filtered it. If we look more detail at fetal development, weeks 9 through 12, you have a lot of brain growth. The liver starts to secrete bile. You see elongation of the bones and ossification, that transformation from the uh, cartilage to bone. You start to see the kidneys producing urine. Um, the eyes have become very well developed. Weeks 13 to 16, you have a lot of sensory organ development, the eyes, the ears, etc. You tend now to be able to see some hair growth on the scalp. The kidneys are well formed. You see meconium being accumulated in the intestines. Weeks 16 through 20, you get much stronger movements. The mother often now can feel uh, the fetus moving. There's continued growth. Weeks 21 through 30, you have rapid weight gain. You start to see surfactant production beginning in the lungs. Um, if baby is preemie preterm and is born before that surfactant when we've talked about the respiratory system uh, 
that's one of the concerns is whether the surfactant, remember, keeps the alveoli basically open from sticking, so they may need to do additional things to help out that that preemie um, if there's not enough surfactant production. In males, the testes will descend down into the scrotum so that they are now at a, a cooler temperature. <coughs> From weeks 31 to birth, uh, you see more subcutaneous fat being formed. The skin is very soft. The lanugo, which is silky kind of hair that covers the body, um, that tends to be shed or disappear. If a baby's born prematurely, sometimes that is still present there. And you also see the needles growing on the, the fingers and the toes. And in terms of the mother, just size-wise, if you will, <coughs> the end of the first trimester, this just gives you relative size. Uh, here in the uterus, the developing uh, fetus. And then by the end of the second trimester, this would be where the fundus is, this top, remember, the top bulge of the uterus. By the end of the uh, second trimester, it would be norm, on average about here, and the end of the third trimester about here. Kind of keep this in mind later when we talk about the effects on the mother. Uh, not so much in the first trimester, but as you continue through the pregnancy, certainly in the third trimester, uh, at how much that uterus has enlarged, being able to hold the developing fetus, you know, you're pushing up against the lungs and against the intestines and down on the bladder. And so you're going to see some of the effects on the mother. So with pregnancy, what are some of the effects of the hormones? Well, the most influential hormones are going to be the estrogen, progesterone, and the HCG. The pregnancy hormones initially are generated and produced in the corpus luteum. Remember, that's what's left over after ovulation. That follicle, when it's released, the oocyte, the remaining uh, supporting cells are the corpus luteum. And so if fertilization did not occur, remember, it disintegrates. Well, if fertilization occurred and you proceed, and implantation was successful, and so you have a pregnancy, the corpus luteum is going to initially be uh, producing these pregnancy hormones. Now, once um, the placenta is developed, the corpus luteum is going to disintegrate usually around week 12 to 17, somewhere in there. <coughs> Excuse me. And the placenta starts to take over the production of those pregnancy hormones. Um, hormones are going to help stimulate fetal growth. They stimulate the maternal tissue growth for uterine enlargement, mammary duct expansion, preparing the mother's body for childbirth. Um, one thing I will say is that HCG, as I said, this is a hormone that's usually what you're testing when you do a pregnancy test. Um, those levels are very high, um, especially just as the placenta tends to take over. Just kind of FYI, there have been some studies that have looked at is the high level of hormones possibly part of what contributes to um, the increased nausea, which typically is referred to as morning sickness, which, by the way, can happen any time during the day. The morning sickness tends for, if women suffer from it, it tends to be worse in the first trimester, which is when the HCG tends to be highest. And so there's there's been some studies that have kind of indicated that if a woman has very high levels of HCG, that may be part of what's causing the morning sickness. Um, because this hormone with the estrogen and progesterone are helping and are so influential in main, maintaining the pregnancy, helping to get it established, that there's also been studies that kind of indicate if you have high, a woman has high levels of these hormones, it may put her at a reduced risk for a miscarriage. And vice versa, if these levels are really low, 
she might actually be at a higher risk for a miscarriage because she's not producing enough of these hormones to help maintain that pregnancy. It was just an interesting study. Weight gain. Weight gain is going to be due to the growing fetus, the enlarged uterus. You've got increased amniotic fluid that the fetus is growing in, the placenta, the breasts are going to enlarge, so you've got additional breast tissue now, and certainly have increased blood volume because the mother's having to provide all these extra nutrients and basically not only providing nutrients and oxygen and all the transport that the circulatory system does for her body, she's doing it also for the developing fetus, so there's increased blood volume. And this um, gives, on average, the weight gain. Obviously, it varies by individual, it varies by pregnancy even. Um, so on average, the fetus is seven to eight pounds. I say for some it's less than that, some it's it's more than that, <coughs> and what the total uh, weight gain may be. And these ratios may change a bit. Um, I know, and just as a point of reference of how it can change, my first child was over nine pounds. My net gain was only 16 pounds, but I also was very sick and was in the hospital because, well, just say for me, morning sickness lasted nine months. <coughs> what are some of the effects that pregnancy are going to have on the mother relative to the different organ systems? Well, in terms of the digestive system, the morning sickness. Um, some women suffer extremely bad from it. I said, I know my first pregnancy, the first four and a half months, I lost 12 pounds because I was so sick. Um, the digestive system, and often you get nausea, vomiting, heartburn. Throughout the pregnancy, especially later in the pregnancy, some women have problems with constipation because the developing fetus is pushing down on the intestines. The urinary, frequent urination, because the urinary bladder is below the uterus. And so as that fetus is developing, it's pushing down on the uterus. You can't hold as much. Plus, you have more blood volume. You have more, you're taking in more liquids. You're producing more liquids, more waste products. You're emptying not only your waste, but the fetus's waste. So frequent urination. In terms of the circulatory <coughs> system, you tend to have increased pulse and increased blood pressure because you are dealing with this increased blood volume, uh, just double duty basically. Some women have issues with varicose veins and hemorrhoids. In terms of the respiratory system, because especially later in the pregnancy, uh, the fetus is pushing up. There's nowhere to go. It's pushing up on the lungs. You may have shortness of breath. You may have increased um, mucus and get uh, increased nasal congestion. In terms of the integumentary system, oftentimes you end up, because of the increased weight, you, stretch marks are going to occur. Stretch marks are due to connective tissue that's below the dermis layer that, that gets torn. With labor and childbirth, oxytocin is a hormone that's going to stimulate uterine contractions. It's one of the ones that operates on positive feedback. So as oxytocin is released, you start to have uterine contractions and as the contractions get stronger, it stimulates the release of more oxytocin, which is going to stimulate stronger and stronger contractions until childbirth occurs. Now, there are different stages of childbirth. There's three stages. The cervical dilation stage, um, this is the stage where the cervix has to dilate to allow for childbirth to occur. It dilates to 10 centimeters. That allows for basically, you know, the head, ideally under optimum conditions, for the head to um, emerge first. 
how long does this stage take? It's really going to vary from woman to woman, from pregnancy to pregnancy. Standard rule of thumb, though, not always, is that typically um, with each pregnancy, that amount of time should decrease. The expulsion stage, that's when the fetal head first enters the birth canal until the birth occurs. Once again, the amount of time here. Um, ideally, you don't want it too, too long, <coughs> but it will vary from one woman to another. You'll cut the umbilical cord. They'll aspirate the mucus from the mouth and the nose, and then the uh, newborn takes its first breath. And then the third stage is after birth. This way you must deliver the placenta and all the associated membranes. Usually after childbirth, the uterine contractions will continue until the placenta is delivered. Um, the doctor or nurse will look at it, um, and you might think, why? And they want to make sure it's intact. They don't want any pieces. They don't want it tear while it's delivered. And any pieces remain attached to the uterus because that can lead to um, very severe internal bleeding. So this just shows the stages of dilation. Here's undilated uh, cervix, and here it's fully dilated to allow for um, hopefully for the childbirth to proceed without any complications. If the newborn is not in this position head down, then it, like if it's feet first, that is breech. There, sometimes they can try to do different things to try to help turn, and oftentimes the fetus will turn naturally. Um, if not, then they may have to do um, surgery. The second stage, as you can see, the expulsion stage, head first. Usually once the head is out, kind of turns, the rest of the baby just kind of slides out. And then the third stage <coughs> is the afterbirth delivery. All I said, the placenta is going to detach from the uterine wall, and it will be delivered. And I say they will check to make sure that you don't receive any or have any pieces remaining. Now, for the newborn, I mean, it's been in a nice, warm, comfy, you know, well, my mom's been taking care of it. It's nice and warm, all the food, everything's supplied, waste are taken care of. It's trauma to go through that birthing process. And so there, are, you have to do evaluations, number one. They do the APGAR scores where they will evaluate, obviously, that newborn to make sure the newborn's okay. There are certain adjustments that the, the newborn has to do, and we call them neonatal adjustments. Respiratory. When it takes the, after you've aspirated the mucus out and the infant takes its first breath, that inflates the lungs. Now you've had amniotic fluid in the lungs, so that that has to drain out, so it either drains or it's reabsorbed. In terms of the circulatory system, some of those shunts, they need to be closed down, if you will. The ductus venosa will degenerate and become the ligamentum venosa below the liver. The foramen ovale becomes the fossa ovalis in the, the atrium walls. The ductus arteriosus becomes the ligamentum arteriosum, so that you don't have that blood now going from the uh, pulmonary artery just beyond the pulmonary trunk into the aorta, you've got to shut all of those down or there's going to be severe consequences from it. In terms of thermoregulatory processes, a newborn produces heat very slowly, but it can lose heat very quickly. For the size of a newborn, they have a lot of surface area for the mass of the, the body, and so it's hard for them to maintain body temperature, so you have to be very careful. Um, that you don't want to overdress them, but you, you want to make sure that that you're helping them as much as possible to maintain that, that body temperature. They do have what's known as brown fat, which helps uh, them to maintain some 
but the other thing is, uh, you know, some of the, like the hypothalamus, some areas of the brain are not fully developed, obviously, at, at birth to be able to help with these regulatory processes. And in terms of the gastrointestinal tract, the intestines of a newborn is sterile. And so our intestines, we have natural microbial flora, or bacterial flora that, that exists naturally in the beneficial uh, aspect. And so that, that has to become established, which as the newborn drinks its first milk, it's going to be getting some of those um, bacteria from mom and or even if you say you're using formula, whichever, um, it will eventually get that, but it just takes time to get that established. And this is just the diagram. Once again, just kind of review before birth. Remember with the shunts that are present in the heart, then immediately after birth, this closes to form the fossa ovalis, and then this closes. Now, because you need to get that proper air flow, uh, blood flow to the lungs, now that the lungs are functioning, to become oxygenated and get rid of the CO2. And then, once again, with the liver, the ductus venosus, you know, have, before birth, mom's taking care of filtering, but now, now that you're into this new world here, um, the liver of the newborn has to start taking over that function of filtering. In terms of lactation, producing the milk, um, ideally this provides the best nutrition. I will say this, not all women are able to breastfeed and that's okay. Um, you do what you can. Breast milk does provide the best option but it's not the only option. It does provide passive immunity to a newborn because a newborn's immune system is not fully functioning until um, for the first couple of months, usually about three months and it's functioning. So the mom can pass antibodies through the breast milk to the newborn to provide some protection. Um, when a woman is breastfeeding, that lactation, that production, production of the breast milk does help to stimulate some mild uterine contractions and this helps to return the uterus to the pre-pregnancy size. It also is going to help increase metabolic rate in the mother so she'll lose some of those fat reserves that she had during the pregnancy. In a woman who is not pregnant, who's not lactating, the breast is mostly adipose tissue with some collagenous tissue, so it's connective tissue that's in there. Now during pregnancy, one of the things that happens with the breast is you start to see extensive branching of the lactiferous ducts um, that's not there beforehand. Prolactin is a hormone that is uh, produced. It helps to establish the breast milk supply and maintain it. Colostrum is uh, what is secrete it first in the first 48 to 72 hours after birth that the newborn um, wins nursing. That is what they're consuming. It has a very high protein content. Typically about three days after birth um, you start to see the secretion of what we call the transitional milk and about day 10 it'll be the mature milk. And so the composition, the chemical composition changes a little bit. Um, as to how much protein, how much fat, like how much sugar, etc., is, is present in there. <coughs> to maintain the lactation, um, it's a supply and demand. If you stop uh, breastfeeding, then you're going to stop with the milk production in there. But this just goes over in a more general aspect of some of the developmental stages. Uh, from fertilization through childbirth.